This is part eight, if I'm not mistaken, as we're going through uh, looking at Paul in the book of Acts. And uh, I think we've gotten up through 1 Corinthians, right? <clears throat> and so it's in, the, it's in the Google Slides presentation here that, that we'll take a look at this here in a little bit. Um, so a few things, let's, let's get started with this real quick. We'll go to, uh, let's go to um, Acts chapter 18. Go to Acts chapter 18. Um, we'll start reading here in verse 23. <clears throat> so one of the things that, uh, that we have is in this, in this section where we are right now, Acts 18.23 starts the third apostolic journey of, of the Apostle Paul. So... Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading Acts chapter 18, verse 23, and then we'll go from there, all right? And we'll find out if I can, if I can see and read. You all tell me. Throw stuff at me if I miss a word. I'll, I'll know if I can't read or not. All right, so Acts 18, 23. And after he had spent some time, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. The man was instructed, or this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him um, unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And it came to pass, chapter 19, verse 1, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we take the information that we study today, uh, study it out for ourselves, that we can come to a clear knowledge and understanding of how you worked in the life of, of Paul, our apostle, during the book of Acts, so that we can get a clear uh, understanding of some of the doctrines that he learned as he went along, uh, and how, how we can take a look at how he applied that through those scriptures. Um, that we might be able to follow that same pattern, that we can glorify your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in His name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, there's a few things I want to clear up last week, cause, and I'd, I'd mentioned this, and, and I, I said a couple things that were wrong, because um, I mis, misread what I had there. So, what do we have here? Paul, he goes back to Antioch at the end of his second apostolic journey in verse 22, right? So he gets back to Antioch in 18, verse 22. So then verse 23, he goes back out to his, for his third apostolic journey. And so he's, he's going through Galatia and, per, and Pergia uh, in order, strengthening all the disciples. So he's going back through and he's fulfilling what he was doing in Acts 14, right? So if you remember in Acts 14, what he would do is he would go into the city, evangelize, and then he would, he would teach them some stuff, and then he would move on to another city, evangelize, teach them some stuff, and then what he did is he came back through to make sure that people were understanding and living based upon the information he gave them, right? So here he's in uh, Galatia and Pergia, and then we're introduced to Apollos, and one of the things that we know about Apollos is, Paul, Apollos is, um, he starts off here in, in Ephesus, and then he goes up to, into Corinth, right? And then we find out in 19 chapter 1, that Paul, uh, passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finally served certain disciples. So we had Apollos was in Ephesus, then he moved to um, uh, Corinth, and then Paul came in kind of behind him, and he was going through Ephesus as well. All right. So just a few things. That That's kind of the, one of the things I wanted to clear up with that, because that's where Paul is, is in Ephesus at this point, because that's, that's a key issue. And I said last week he was from he was in Corinth because I highlighted the wrong city, and that was my fault. Um, but I think we we cleaned it up last week, but I want to make sure that we got it clean this week. All right. 
So a few things that we want to think about before we get going. Why, why is it important for us to understand when Paul, and, and when we talked about this before, it's not, we're not worried about what date or what year Paul wrote um, his epistles, but why is it important for us to know when he wrote certain epistles or all of his epistles because we're going to look at all of them. Um, one of the things that we, we know that we, we've looked at before as we've gone through is the timeline in which we find ourselves. Acts chapter 9, uh, Paul's on the road to Damascus, gets saved. Uh, then he starts his first apostolic journey in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through chapter 14, uh, verse 28, which is really the whole chapter 13 and 14. And then we move on to that timeline that we have, Acts 15 was the Jerusalem Council, Acts 16, 1 through 18, 22, we just talked about it's that second apostolic journey. Then the third apostolic journey starts almost immediately after that, as far as scripture goes. Now, how much time is there between verse 22 and 23? I'm not sure. Is there what we would probably refer to as a time or a gap of time between those? I don't know. And again, the time isn't really the issue there. We're looking at historically, according to Acts 18.23, Paul goes out on his third apostolic journey and goes through chapter 21, verse 17. Then um, Acts chapter 27 through um, Acts 28.16, he's trying to get to Rome. Um, and he gets there uh, or right around Acts 28, verse 16, verse 17. He finally gets there. The problem is, is it's not a good way to get there. Um, he didn't jump on a bus or anything to take him there. He was getting down to Jerusalem, and they put him in prison. They took him up there. So then around that period of time, from Acts 28, 17 to the end of Acts 28, he's in prison. Well, then he's let free or um, let loose, if you want to put it that way, um, for about anywhere between two to five years. All right, and again, the timing I'm not really interested in, but I've read uh, some, some folks say that he was, he was free in between his two imprisonments for two years. Some say it's up to five, so I feel comfortable saying anywhere from two to five. And again, the dates I don't really care about. And then he goes into prison again in Rome. All right, and those are the, the things that we want to make sure that we keep in mind. Now, the one thing I do want us to not get caught up in is, um, the captivity and the imprisonments, or the, the free time and the imprisonment there, the second one, all that doesn't take place at the end of Acts chapter 28. All right. So the first imprisonments during the, uh, towards the end of Acts 28, and then after Acts 28, um, you have his um, freedom, um, and then the, uh, the second Roman imprisonment. Okay. So that's the timeline, and I probably, if I'd have thought about it, I should have put my maps up there uh, so we'll know what's going on. All right, so one of, the, one of the things that we've already talked about before that we've looked at is the, as, as Paul starts going out, the very first place that we really look at that he visits that we really care about as far as because he wrote a book to him is Galatia. So during his first apostolic journey, he went to a lot of different places. The place that we were interested in was the fact that he went to Galatia during that time. Right? And again, the only reason that we are looking at that specifically is because that was um, one of the books that he had written to them. All right? So then uh, you had the Jerusalem Council shortly after that. He goes on a second apostolic journey. Um, and again, we're just looking mainly, all I care about really right now is the actual cities that he went to while he was going through those that he wrote books to. All right? He went to a whole lot more places in Galatia, Philippi, Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, uh, depends on how you want to say it, or Corinth, all right? and Corinth. So those were the four places that, that he had gone to during his second apostolic journey. Um, I, I, and we'd mentioned this before. Somebody might say, well, at the end of Acts chapter 18, right around verses 18 or 19, it says that he went to Ephesus during his second apostolic journey. 
uh, he wasn't there for a long period of time, which is why I didn't put it there. Okay, when we see him in his third apostolic journey, he's there for over a two-year period in Ephesus. All right, so during that third apostolic journey, he goes to Ephesus for a long period of time, and I would say that's probably more so when he established that church. All right, so then you got Galatia, Ephesus, and Philippi, and <clears throat> Then the only other one that we've not gotten to where he gets to is Rome, right? And so then we'll talk about that as, as we move forward, okay? So one of the first things we've already talked about is the fact that Galatians was probably written shortly after that Jerusalem council, so probably early on in his second apostolic journey. And I think we put it towards the end of Acts 15 a little bit. Some people will say the first few verses or so of Acts chapter 16. Um, that one's really hard to pin down. We've already talked about that one, right? But we do know, or I feel comfortable in, that he probably wrote it shortly after the Jerusalem Council because of the doctrine, right? And that's one of those things that we've already talked about as, as we've gone, gone forward. Um, second book that we've got him writing is First Thessalonians, and we pin that one down to about Acts 18, verse 5. So you've got somewhere around Acts 16, Galatians is written, uh, Acts 18, First Thessalonians is written uh, during his second apostolic journey. And for those that are just joining online, um, you can go back and watch the videos that we did on those and, and kind of get caught back up with that. Now, one of the things we talked about last week is, again, what was, the, what was the main issue in Thessalonica, or Thessalonica, what was the main issue that they were dealing with after, after he wrote that book, 1 Corinthians, was they'd lost their hope, right? So then, again, because of the fact that 2 Thessalonians is dealing with some major doctrinal issues, I would say he probably wrote it uh, shortly after his, uh, shortly after he wrote the the first Thessalonians. Uh, he gets some news back, and they've lost their hope, and and so then he's got to uh, reestablish them in that doctrine, right? So I've got him. He's probably he might be still in Corinth, or maybe even at Ephesus, towards the end of um, his second apostolic journey there. So late mid to late Acts 18. So he could have been, for instance, like, you know, it's in, in Acts 18, verse 19, it says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So in Acts 18, 19, he's in Ephesus. So it could have been during that time when he wrote this book. Could have been a little bit before, uh, while he was still in Corinth. But, and again, does it really matter exactly where it is? No, but we do know it was written after 1 Thessalonians, and we know that that, that was one of those main doctrinal issues that, that he wanted to make sure that they were able to pick up on. All right? So that was one that we talked about last week. And then we ended up, uh, we talked about uh, 1 Corinthians, right? <clears throat> so we put uh, 1 Corinthians written probably right after that no small stir in Acts 19, verse 23 during his second apostolic journey. And we'll see more of that uh, specifically when we look at 2 Corinthians today. All right. <clears throat> so we've got Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st Corinthians. So we've got four of his epistles that I feel confident in, and hopefully you all do, where we've got them placed. Okay. So I've got it. You know, if you drop down to chapter 19, um, Acts chapter 19, verse... 21. <clears throat> Paul's still in Ephesus at this time. Acts chapter 19, verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through uh, Macedonia and Achaia uh, to go, tr go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. So that's one of those things we've already talked about before. Paul really wants to get to Rome. <laughs> um, and, and that's one of those things we've talked about 
and we've looked at it. That's that's that was one of his desires to be able to do so. Verse 22. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. And the same and in the same time there arose no small stir about that way. All right. And then he starts dealing with the folks that that are following Diana. All right. And so then we know exactly where he is. Alexander becomes a problem. You know, there's something. And I, I'd mention this real quick just because in Acts chapter 16, and this is something I've been thinking about lately. Do you all remember us doing the, the, the study on don't be the core of the body of Christ where we looked at Korah in the Old Testament who's called Korah in the New Testament? Uh, Kor, he withstood Moses. All right, he he, you had the gain saying that he was saying Moses isn't Moses isn't the one that we need to follow, uh, and what he was trying to do is to to play down, I guess, his authority. And so then, with the whole purpose of that study was, don't be a core to the body of Christ. Don't go around saying that Paul doesn't have authority and he's not our apostle and things like that. Well, on the flip side, you also have. A lot of times where in, in Scripture, and this is one of those that I've found, you'll either have somebody come along saying, don't pay attention to this person, or you'll have somebody that doesn't care about what you're doing going around saying, hey, you all need to follow this person, and everybody's like, that person's crazy. I'm not going to follow this person if they say follow. Does that make sense? Uh, and so that's what Paul runs into in Acts chapter 16. There's a, um, a certain damsel who is going around uh, with divination and she's doing all of her little things. And then she turns around, she's following Paul and Barnabas and saying, hey, you all need to listen to these guys. So it's kind of like two ends of the spectrum. So that I'm, I'm working on something like that because there's some things that's going on there. It's the same kind of thing that's going on here because what, what when you take a look at this no small stir, what do they get upset about? And it's the same thing, what do they get upset about in Acts 16 is... When you have somebody coming along saying, hey, what you all are teaching is wrong, you shouldn't follow Diana. And then you've got these people over here who are making statues of Diana and they're losing business. What do they do? They come and attack you. And so that, that's, that's one of those things that we see here is Paul's taking away their, their, their way of making money. And uh, so that's one of those things... To, to think about as we're going through with this. So we have Paul here in Ephesus, up in, the, in, up in Asia, that area, up in Ephesus, and he's talking about, uh, talking to these folks, and there's no small stir, all right? So that's what we're going to be dealing with as we go through here. So let's get this real quick. Get to Acts chapter 20 and get uh, 2 Corinthians, all right? So one of the things that we should know is um, well it should make sense is do we think that 2 Corinthians would probably be written after 1 Corinthians well number wise it would make sense alright so then here's here's one of the things why, why we would say this uh, Acts chapter 20 notice in verse 1 um, Acts chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. So, where is Paul? Before we read verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 1, where is Paul? He's in Ephesus, right? Huh? What did you say? That's fine. He's in Ephesus, right? So that's when that no small stir takes place. In chapter 20, verse 1, he says, And after the uproar was ceased, all right, Paul called unto him his disciples and embraced them and departed to go, uh, for to go into Macedonia, right? So Paul's in Ephesus and he's wanting to go to Macedonia in chapter 20, verse 1. We see that? And that's after that uproar, after that no small stir uh, had taken place. All right, so jump over to 2 Corinthians. Hold your place there in Acts. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul's in really Asia, right? 
we, we we're putting it at Ephesus. Really, in in chapter 19, it says he's in Asia, and that's where that no small stir takes place and all that stuff. Notice in Second Corinthians chapter one, Second Corinthians chapter one, verse eight. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse eight. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us where. In Asia, all right? So the trouble that he had in Asia was that no small stir or that, as Acts chapter 20, verse 1, that uproar, all right? So could, could Paul have written, about, written to the folks in Corinth about the event before it took place? No, so that, that uproar, that no small stir would have already had to have taken place uh, so then he says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. All right? So when we take a look at those verses, the earliest that he could have written would have been after the uproar, all right? or after that no small stir. Does that kind of make sense? All right, so he's telling them about it, so it has to work that way. Um, drop down to verse 12. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Um, notice in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, For our rejoicing for this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simp um, simplicity and godly sincerity, not with, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. All right. So when we talk about the, the, the we here, who is it that he's dealing with is, is uh, if you look at chapter 1, verse 1. I just read the wrong verse, didn't I? And no one said anything. No, I'm, I went to chapter 1. <laughs> I read the wrong chapter. My bad. Yeah. Man. I just thought you. Yeah, no, you're good. You're like, what kind of versions does this guy have? My bad. <laughs> All right. We are supposed to be in two. We are supposed to be in chapter chapter two. That's my fault. <laughs> that's my fault. <laughs> that is, yeah. All right. Well, it. It's going, it's going to work out. So, so he's talking about the we there, right? So who is the we? If you look at chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth. Um, so he's talking about him and himself and Timothy, right? Now, let's actually look at chapter 2, verse 12. That's my fault. All right, notice chapter 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. So when we take a look at this, this door of opportunity that he talks about here, um, is, is really when he goes into Macedonia in, in, um, um, in the book of Acts. Right, and so he's he was he was at uh, he was at Ephesus, and this 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 door that he's talking about that they were able to preach. Uh, the only problem is is who's he looking for here? He's looking for Titus, and he doesn't find him. Right, so then he's in Ephesus, and then he goes to Troas, and he leaves Macedonia after those events that took place in the the no small stir or that uproar. All right. So he has these folks that are going with him, and he's going from Ephesus up to Troas, where, uh, where he's able to preach the gospel along with uh, the folks that were going on with him. All right. So <clears throat> then he probably visited uh, Philippi and Thessalonica um, after he had written those things as well. In fact, go over chapter 7. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll get all this stuff figured out eventually. About what? what about when he wrote Second Corinthians. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs>
So there's this thing called the Bible. Right. We're stuck. I'm just joking. <laughs> so, we, <laughs> so we've established when 1 Corinthians was written, right? Right? Is that what we were We've already established that. Okay. That was the small stir in Acts 19 to 23. Now we're working on 2 Corinthians okay. to see when it was written. Yeah. Well, no. No, you're fine. <laughs> yes, we're establishing about when Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. And so I'm trying to get in that timeline where we are during his third, during his third apostolic journey, right? There's a small stir at the end... At, um, at the end, really midway, almost towards the end of Acts chapter 19, right? And that's that, that's that trouble that he talks about in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8, all right? And then he's talking about he's going from Ephesus up to Troas, okay? And we're trying to see where he is in, 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 in the line here. Can I divert for just a second? Sure. Since she's already found it. Oh, we've diverted from the very beginning. Well, it's it's the same thing, and that that's a good question. So, for those that are that are watching online, if you may not have heard the question, um, we're we're confident that Paul wrote three epistles to the to the folks at Corinth, but only two of them are considered scripture. So, why wasn't the third one? Or how could he write something that wasn't? Um, if you go to Second Peter chapter three. It kind of, it goes along with that with that same thought process. Um, so, so when we read in Second Peter chapter three, and of course, remember, what are we having? To, what is what is Peter having to deal with when he's when he's when he's writing Second Peter? What is it that he's having to deal with? Is hey, I've got all these people, the little flock, who are asking me why hasn't the kingdom come? Right? Because that's what they were expecting to happen. And so then in 2 Peter chapter 3, he's writing to them and also he's writing to future tribulation saints so that they'll, so that they'll know that that stuff's still going to come. In uh, chapter 3, verse 15, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath what? written unto you so is it possible that Paul wrote something to the Jews to the little flock all right he it says he's written unto you well who's his audience is that little flock in verse 16 notice he says as also in all his epistles so he's telling them about the long suffering of God in this in this something that he has written unto them um, and then he says, as also in all of his epistles. So he wrote something to that little flock to let them know about the long suffering, but it's not considered part of his epistles. All right, and that's the verse that a lot of people say, well, that's the Hebrews. He wrote Hebrews, and that's the verse that they use to prove that. And that verse doesn't prove it because he says he wrote something, but then he talks about that long suffering as he did in all of his epistles. So if if they're saying that that what he wrote isn't part of his epistles, then he couldn't have written Hebrews. Otherwise, that would be part of his epistles. Um, and so then I would see that as more of there was something that Paul wrote or to let them know this is why the kingdom hasn't come. This is why judgment hasn't started. This is why the 70th week of Daniel hasn't taken place. But it was something that he wrote 
that's not in the canon of scriptures. Does that kind of make sense? So it it follows that same thought process is um, he could have written it um, and it not be part of the canon of scripture. Um, And so that's why that's why I would say it's possible to do that. Um, You know, as we go through here, how many times did Paul go to Corinth? Uh, there's there's a verse that he talks about. It says, "This is the third time I've come unto you." Well, how many times did he actually go to them? You know, is, did he actually physically make three trips to them, or is it the third time that he's coming by way of uh, of an epistle? But um, and there's some other things we could look at on that. But no, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, but I think that Second Peter three would kind of help answer that. Um, that's a good question alright so 2 Corinthians chapter 7 right that's where we are so 2 Corinthians chapter 7 um, so remember we just read that he couldn't find Titus right so 2 Corinthians chapter 7 notice in uh, verse Start off in verse 4. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glory of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, all right, so where is he now? He's talking about, I'm in Macedonia. Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings and within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So who shows up? Titus. All right, so he's, he's in Macedonia, and he's going through all this stuff, and he looks up, and all of a sudden, hey, here's Titus. Titus has come, and he's comforted by him. So I want you to think of something real quick, and this is kind of an off, offshoot of, of this. Is How is it that Paul was comforted? Did God send a feeling down to him? and tickle the back of his neck and, and let the hairs on the back of his neck raise up and let him know that God's with him? No, how was Paul comforted? By Titus showing up and talking to him, right? So when we talk about these things, you know, how do we know that God's working in our midst is when we see people who are saved, who come in and they comfort us through that. That's how he was comforted is by the coming of Titus. Titus shows up, all right? Um, drop down to drop down to chapter twelve, all right. And this is this is what I was talking about uh, a minute ago with the third time. Notice Second Corinthians chapter twelve. <clears throat> We'll start here in verse 14. All right. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. Behold, behold, the third time, what's those next three words? I am ready to what? To come to you. So he's saying, I want to come to you all for a third time, right? In chapter 12, verse 14. Behold, the third time, I am ready to come unto you, come to you, and I will not be burdensome uh, to you, and and so on and so forth. We'll drop down to chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1. Notice he says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So when we look at this, you know, in verse verse 2, he says, I told you before and foretell you, as if I were present the second time, and being absent now, I write them which um, heretofore have sinned unto all other, that, it, that, it's, that, uh, that if I come again, I will not uh, spare. So then if we look at this, you know, as we're going down through here, he's saying, I'm ready to go for the third time in, in verse chapter 12, verse 14. Chapter 13, verse 1, he says, this is the third time I'm coming in, um, that I'm coming, in, uh, coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses, so every word be established. So then, what do we see? He's wanting to come. He's ready to come. He's sending Titus and some other folks up there with it. 
And then chapter 13, 1, he says, I'm on my way, but I'm not there yet. And what we do is, if we can figure out where these things are, when, uh, when Paul deals with an uproar, when he leaves Ephesus, and when he goes to Macedonia, and he's not on his way yet, to, and he's still on his way to, to Corinth, if we can figure out those things, then we can figure out about the time when he wrote 2 Corinthians. Because he's saying, I want to come up to you a third time. I've already talked about this uproar and some other things that are going on. Um, and some, something else that we need to add in with it. Go to chapter 8. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, notice in verse, starting verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 15. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you, for indeed, uh, he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went, un, uh, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. So we see here he's got Titus, and he's talking about Titus, and I want to send Titus up. And really what he's dealing with here in the context is the, uh, in, in chapter 9, verse 1, he's talking about is touching the ministering of the saints. What he's doing is, Titus and all these guys are going to be coming around picking up money. And they're going to take that money up to Jerusalem. All right? And that's, that's, that's what he's dealing with at this particular time. Is He's got a collection from Macedonia to take up to the saints at Jerusalem uh, that we can see down at notice in verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother, uh, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent, in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you, whether any uh, do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brother uh, be inquired of, they are the messengers of the church and the glory of Christ. And he goes on down, like I said, he's talking about the ministering to the saints and giving and all that stuff. So he's going around sending Titus to go pick up these, these collections, Titus and some other guys to pick up these collections from Macedonia, all right? And then he's going to take it up to Jerusalem, okay? So what he's doing in chapter 12, and as we've already looked at, uh, he's looking at making his way up to um, Macedonia, right? So he's, he's in Ephesus, then he leaves and uh, Mace goes to Macedonia, and he's trying to make his way back for a third time up to Corinth. So can we figure out in Acts a time when he's in Ephesus, then he goes to Macedonia, and he's trying to get up to Corinth. All right, so that's what we want to do. Go back to Acts. Because if we can figure out those things as little, you know, on a map, when you, when you look on Google Maps or something like that, and you go look on Google Maps and you set one of those little markers down, right, so you'll know where you are. So then that's what we're wanting to do is can we figure out a time where he's in Ephesus and then he goes to Macedonia and then he's trying to make his way um, to Corinth. Okay, so <clears throat> Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding cert certain disciples. All right, so we've already talked about the fact in chapter 1 in 2 Corinthians, he's already dealt with that uproar, right? That no small stir. So he's talked about that in 2 Corinthians. So we're after that. Okay, so he's here in Acts chapter 19. He's at Ephesus. All right, so that's one of those points that we wanted to have to figure out where he was. All right, so he's dealing with some folks there in Ephesus. <clears throat> um, chapter 19, verse 23, you have that no small stir. Notice in chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20. Paul was in Ephesus. He had a small stir. What takes place in Acts chapter 20 verse 1. 
After that, that, that uproar, notice verse 1, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples, and embraced them, and departed for to go into what? Macedonia. All right, so one of the things that we've talked about is what? The place that we want to find out is there is there a time in Acts where Paul's in Ephesus. There's an uproar that he has to deal with getting beaten, stoned like he always does. <laughs> you know how hard it is to not find a place in Acts where Paul's not beaten and stoned and, and, and people just don't like him? It's really hard. Uh, but is there a time where we see he's in Ephesus, there's an uproar, and then he goes to Macedonia? Well, right here, he's in Ephesus. You have the uproar in chapter 20, verse 1. After the uproar was ceased, where does he go? Macedonia. All right. And then if you keep on going down, he says, And when, he, when, when, um, when, uh, when he had gone over these parts, in verse 2, and, and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. And there abode three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied in, uh, him into uh, Asia, Sosipater, or Sopater, of uh, Berea, and of the Thess uh, Thessalonians, Ar uh, Ar Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timotheus, and of Asia, and Tychicus, and Trophimus. Uh, they're, they're going before tarried for us at Troas, all right? So then we see kind of where he is at this particular time. Where, where are some of, the, some of the things that he, he does? Is if you keep on going in um, verse 4, he's dealing with um, some of those folks that are coming along with him. He goes into Tro, uh, Troas, and then he goes into Miletus, and we get an idea of what's going on there, all right? So here's the thing. <clears throat> Where is he in terms of where he is? Is he's where? Ephesus, small stir, Macedonia. He's in, he's in Ephesus when he's, when, he's, uh, when he's dealing with this stuff. And then he goes, uh, goes on down. He goes, he's deals with the uh, Thessalonians, the Philippians, Bereans, all that stuff. And then he gets to Greece. So, as we said, the markers we were looking for was Ephesus, a small stir or something, some problems that he had, and then he goes to Macedonia. All right, so those were the, some of the markers that we have for 2 Corinthians. So when do we see this? It is right around uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 1. He's in Ephesus, small, spur, small stir, the, the, the uproar takes place, and then he's, he's on his way to Macedonia. So I would say that 2 Corinthians was probably written right around... Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 1, 2, 3, somewhere around in there. Okay, based on Just based on those markers that we have, as far as he's got to be in Ephesus, he leaves Ephesus to go to Macedonia, and he's already talking about the, the no small stir, that commotion, and the problem that they have there at Ephesus. All right. Now, the thing about this is, <clears throat> This is right around the exact same time that Paul writes Romans. All right, so it's one of those things we've talked about before. When we think about when these things take place, and I told you all, the first few are kind of spread out, but then it starts to, to snowball pretty quickly until he goes to prison. Um, and then prison, he gets, I mean, you have nothing else but time to write <laughs> letters, right? So 2 Corinthians, based upon those criteria as far as he's in Ephesus, there's an issue, um, people don't like him, like always, and then he goes into Macedonia, so right around Acts chapter 20, verse 1, all right? Questions? Is that clear as mud? Do we know what we're doing now? Because I, cause I, sometimes I feel like I don't know if I'm coming across right is that clear okay all right um real quick let's talk about the book of romans all right and i've already mentioned that that it, that we're pretty confident that he wrote romans about the same time that he was writing second corinthians um what's the what's the major thing that he talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
What's that main thing that he talks about in Second Corinthians chapter 12? The thorn in the flesh. All right, and his prayer that asking Jesus Christ to take it away three times. And then what does he learn? That my grace is sufficient for thee. And then he says, well, much what I'm going to glory in my infirmities. So about that same time that he learned that and wrote about that, he's also writing the book to Rome. And what's he say in Romans chapter 8? It says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. So what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is he's learning some things and he's talking about it in the book of Romans because those things are going on at about the same time. All right, so one of the things that we want to make sure that we get first is notice in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 <clears throat> verse 10. Romans chapter 1 verse 10. Paul says, making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end that you may be established, that is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So, question. When Paul is writing this in, in first, the first chapter, 10 through 13, is he saying, I've already been to Rome? Or is he saying, I'm in Rome? Or is he saying, I want to come to Rome? All right, so when is it that Paul gets to Rome is over here at Acts chapter 28 when he's put in prison. All right, so could Paul have written the book of Romans after Acts 28? No, all right, so it couldn't have been during his first prison, prison, imprisonment, during his free time. <laughs> I don't know why, I just, anyway. Or his second imprisonment, all right, because he'd already been to Rome those times. So it had to have been prior to that. Okay, so that's one of those things that we want to make sure that we keep in mind as we go along. So this is, this is one of the few times that, that he's writing to a church that's established that he's not established. And it's kind of, he, he, you know, and, and you go through and who is it that he's talking about in the end of Acts or in the, at the end of Romans? He's talking about, hey, here's all these different groups and a lot of them are house churches and things like that. Okay, um, so go to Ram, uh, Romans chapter, Romans chapter 15, because <clears throat> I want you to think, this is contemporary to 2 Corinthians, and, and here's one of the reasons why, and, and we're going to look at this um, a little bit as we go through here. here, here's one of the reasons why that we know that, okay, in Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 22. Romans 15, 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way uh, thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Notice, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of, notice, Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Okay, when, when Paul's going through... And he's, you know, he's going from Ephesus to Macedonia. He gets money from Macedonia. And he's talking to the folks in Corinth. And, and we'll see this. What was his issue with he's telling the folks in Corinth about is, we're going to take this up here. We're going to take this money that we're collecting. We're going to take it up to Jerusalem. And right here he's talking to the folks here at Rome. and says, we're going to go up here. And 
For it hath pleased them, in verse 26, of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Uh, it hath pleased them verily, and their, and, then, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in, the, in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, right? What's the this? What is it that he's wanting to perform? Taking that contribution to the to the folks in Jerusalem. Notice he says, and had and have sealed them to this fruit. I will come by you uh, uh, into Spain. All right. So he's saying, I've got this collection. I'm going to take up to Jerusalem, and after I'm done with that, I'm going to come up, and I'm going to come visit you all. Okay. And so he's got this collection that he's got from all these different churches. Um, he even has the one from, uh, um, well, he has, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny how he does this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, um, second, in fact, go look at this real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, because this, this goes along with this uh, right here at this point. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Um, notice in verse 1. <clears throat> Alright, so this, this goes along with what we were talking about a minute ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, For as, touch, for as touching the ministering to the saints, it is, super, it is superfluous for me to, to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them in, of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready." Lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. So what's Paul saying here? The folks in Corinth is saying, hey, I've told Macedonia and Achaia of, of the fact that you all are given. And he's saying, you all need to make sure that you've got this collection ready so that if we show up, don't be unprepared. He says, I don't want you to be ashamed. If, Macedon if the folks from Macedonia come up with me and find you all unprepared, he says, you all are going to be ashamed. And he's not, he, he says, and, and, and notice he says there, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed. He's saying, I would be ashamed as well if, uh, if you all are unprepared. So he's trying to get them to get their stuff together. Uh, for this for this collection for the uh, uh, for the folks up in Jerusalem, so what he does is he sends Second uh, Corinthians, the book of Second Corinthians, to them through Titus and some others, and then Paul shows up in Corinth and he's warning them to get the collection ready. All right, uh, back over to Romans chapter fifteen. All right, so see why. See why he's talking about this collection from Macedonia and Achaia, and he's talking to the folks in Corinth about that same collection. That's one reason why I would say that these two were probably written at about the same time. They would have been contemporary with one another. Um, and, and, and we'll see this as we go through. Um, Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> Notice here in Romans chapter 15, verse... Verse 25. <clears throat> but now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them out of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Uh, and then he goes on down through there. So he's got the money from Macedonia and from Achaia. Um, do you think that he would have... Do you think he would have already had the money from the folks at Corinth? By this time, you know, when, when, he's, when he's saying this, uh, but now I go into Jerusalem to minister under the saints. Has he already gone to Corinth and picked up that money, along with the money from Macedonia and Achaia, to take up to the folks in Jerusalem? All right, so he would have had to have written Romans after Second Corinthians, shortly after 
and when I say shortly, I really mean shortly after. Uh, they would have been written or about the same time. So he's talking about this um, at, at the same time he's talking about um, this gift from everyone. Um, and then one other thing that I want to get here real quick is um, get 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and, and Romans chapter 16 here. So Romans chapter 16 and get uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Get uh, so we'll look at First Corinthians chapter one first. First Corinthians chapter one. Notice verse thirteen. He says, "Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul?" I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. All right. So, question: Where is Gaius? Did I lose? Did I lose you all again? Did I lose you all again? Are we good? Are you sure? All right. So, First Corinthians, chapter one, verse fourteen. He says, "I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius." So, if he says, "I, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but two people," where do you think Crispus and Gaius live? So he's where? He, he's writing the book of Corinthians, right? First Corinthians. And he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So Crispus and Gaius would have been Corinthians, right? So Gaius would have been living in Corinth, right? So go back to Romans 16. <clears throat> All right, so according to 1 Corinthians 1, 14, we know that Gaius lives in Corinth, right? Notice in Romans 16, verse... Um, start off in verse uh, 19 here. Romans 6, 16, verse 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men, and I am glad, therefore, uh, on your behalf... But yet I would have, um, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good, and simple, and concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Notice Timotheus, my fellow worker, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, uh, thy my kinsmen, salute you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Notice in verse twenty-three, Gaius, mine host. And of the whole church saluteth you, Erastus and uh, the chamberlain of the city saluteth you, and Cordus a brother. So, who is it that Paul is staying with when he writes the book of Romans? Gaius, right? Where is Gaius? He lives in Corinth. So, where is Paul when he writes the book of Romans is in Corinth, all right? So, well, while he's in Corinth there, <clears throat> um, that's why I said, after 2 Corinthians, but shortly after. And like I said, when I mean shortly after, I mean shortly after. Go back to Acts chapter 20. Okay. Okay. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> Notice in verse 1. Right? Acts chapter 20, verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over all those parts, he had given them much exhortation, he came into what? Greece. Now, what's one of the main cities that we know of in Greece? Corinth. All right. And then he says, And these abode three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. So when we take a look at this, he's in Macedonia, then he goes to Greece, which is 
uh, where Corinth would be. He's there for three months. So I would say, as I said, he probably wrote Romans after 2 Corinthians, and I mean shortly after, like the next verse. <laughs> All right now, and of course, it's you know again, what's the time frame between those two? Uh, again, I'm not worried about the the time frame of it, but he had to have written it before his imprisonment in Acts 28. But it had to be after Second Corinthians because he's talking about taking up that offering and taking that offering up to Jerusalem, and he tells the folks in Rome, "Hey, I want to come up to you all, and as soon as I take this money down to Jerusalem, then I'm going to come up." And so he's staying with Gaius in Corinth. Uh, when he wrote the book of Romans, All right? So I would say probably Romans chapter 20, or Acts chapter 20, probably verse 2, right around in that area, All right? Some, somewhere between 1 and 3. And that's why I said um, not just shortly after, but like extremely shortly after, uh, he would have, I would have imagined he's probably writing both of those at the same time, Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. I would say probably about the same time. He would have sent Second Corinthians out before he would have sent Rome Romans out. So he would have he he would have finished them about the same time. Like I said, how much time how much time is there um, from when he goes to Macedonia? And how much time, it says, notice in verse 2, it says, and when he, when he had gone over the, those parts, which is Macedonia, and had given them much exhortation, then he came into Greece. All right? So he's, he's in Greece for three months. So sometime after he had written Second Corinthians, he could have been working on it at the same time. Um, but the Second Corinthians would have been put out, I guess, published, if you want to call it that way, um, actually sent out about that same time that he would have been writing Romans. But because he has to be in the same city with Gaius when he's writing it, that's why I'd say verse 2 is probably where he is. Okay. All right. Go to Acts 28. All right, so what do we have? We've got, what, six books now? Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the book of Romans. So we've got six of them. And like I said, the others go fairly quickly, and I don't think we'll be able to finish them all today. But there's a couple things that we do want to get uh, as we go through here. <clears throat> now, the funny thing is, is I found... Um, through Brian Ross, I found, and this would have saved me a whole bunch of time, but that's okay. I found a thing through Brian Ross that David Reed did, and um, he's got the same stuff that we've gotten so far as far as when he when when these books would have been written um, chronologically, and then um, it's really neat that it's pretty much identical to what we found out so all right so Acts chapter 28 let's look at verse look at verse 15 and this is This is, this is one of those things that, that when I saw it a few weeks ago, I posted it on Facebook, and I was like, hey, has anybody else noticed this? Notice in Acts chapter 28, verse 15, it says, And from thence, so he, he's one, well, they're going towards Rome. All right, notice in, in verse 15, it says, And from thence, when the brethren, brethren heard of, the, of us, they came to meet us as far as a pie, uh, a pie of forum, and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Now, 
this is this is one of those things that that I posted up and I said so in my Bible the three taverns the word three is capitalized or the word the is capitalized and three taverns is not all right so I don't know what it's like in your alls um, same thing huh okay so then there's so I posted it up and I was like I'm just kind of curious if anybody else says this why, why would the word the be capitalized, but the three, ta three taverns wouldn't be? Um, and so what we, what we found out, Brian Ross and a couple of other people had mentioned, you know, some versions of the King James Bible doesn't have the capitalized, but it has three taverns capitalized, both of them. And so little things like that kind of make you, make you wonder. So here, here's what it is. Apparently, there is a place called the three taverns, at Appi Forum. So I don't know the difference in, in the capitalizations and all that stuff. But that was one of those things that jumped out at me. I was like, why is the word the in the middle of a sentence capitalized? Um, but I guess it's calling to the fact that there is this place that's called the Three, the three Taverns. But anyway, um, that jumped out at me a few weeks ago. And so I sought counsel on it. <clears throat> But notice in verse 16, And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captains of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. So what do we notice about Paul here? He finally gets to Rome. What's the problem? He's a prisoner. All right. So Paul goes into prison. Um, he, gets, he finally gets to Rome in Acts chapter 28, verse 16, but he arrives there as a prisoner. So this is his first imprisonment all right and so from here all the way through <clears throat> um, notice in verse 30 notice in in um, Romans chapter 28 verse 30 and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So one of the things we see here is how long is Paul in prison for, this first, for his first imprisonment? Well, he's in prison for two years. He's in his own hired house and he, he is allowed visitors, right? Which is kind of strange to me. I mean, you've got this guy that's out here preaching this stuff and, um, and you take him in, into prison, but he's allowed visitors. I mean, he, he wasn't, you know, in verse 16, he wasn't kept with the other prisoners in the guard. He had his own guard by himself, but yet he was in this place for two years and um, he's allowed to have visitors, which is an important thing when we think about uh, what's going on. So here's what I want to do. Uh, go get... Go get Ephesians chapter 6 real quick. <clears throat> so as far as the next four that we're going to talk about, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, or Philemon, however you want to say it, the order on these, I don't really know of anything that I've seen that would say this has to be before the other one. Um, but... <clears throat> Notice in, in, in Ephesians, I almost said Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 6, notice in verse 20. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20 says, For which I am an ambassador, notice, in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So what do we know about Paul? He's what? In bonds. All right. If you look at verse 21, but that ye also may know my affairs, how I do and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord shall make known to you all things. So what do we know about him being in his own hired house and he's allowed visitors is Tychicus is one of those visitors. So we have here, Tychicus is able to go and visit with Paul, and then he's going to go back and tell all the folks in, in Ephesus about everything that's going on with him. So we see that Paul's in bonds in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 20. 
And so then we notice that he is in prison while he writes this. And as I said, those next four, it goes pretty quickly. Uh, the next four, we can see that he's going to write in prison. So Ephesians, I would say, and again, the order of these four is not really clear. Um, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, he would, or Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, he would have written it about the same time while he's in prison for that two-year period. He's allowed visitors, one of which is Tychicus that we see here. Um, get uh, Philippians chapter 1 real quick. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. Notice in verse 13. Philippians chapter 1 verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So one of the things that we think about real quick here is in, when he's writing Philippians is Paul in prison. Yes. And he says, notice he says here, um, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest where? In all the palace. Well, drop down to chapter 4, verse 21. Notice in Philippians chapter 4, verse 21, notice he says, Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So whose palace is he talking about that his bonds would be able to do something with? Is in Caesar's household. Caesar's palace. And it's not the gambling spot. Right? So you have Caesar's palace. Paul's, Paul's dealing with that. He's in Rome. He's in prison when he's writing the book of Philippians. All right? So he's in Caesar's household. He writes to Rome or he writes the, to, to the folks in Philippi, who, by the, way, by the way, he visited during his second apostolic journey, right? So then there's some things. You know what's good? To be visited by Paul here and have him start up the, the church and you not have any problems or him having to deal with anything until you get over here, unlike the folks in Galatia. <laughs> as soon as he leaves, he's got to write something to them and fix their stuff. Um, so, so that's where he is, right? Um, notice Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. Um, let's get... Uh, Let's take a look at verse 28. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, verse 28, 28. Notice he says, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Now, what's the salvation that he's talking about? Well, if you look at chapter 1, verse 19, notice he says, For I know that this shall turn to, to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Is Paul a saved individual by the time he's writing the book of, of Philippians in Rome? Absolutely he is. He was, he was saved years and years and years before. So what's the salvation that he's talking about there is what? Well, he's talking about the persecution and all that stuff and dealing with all those things and, and he's saying... I'm just going to go and keep on preaching because it doesn't matter. If you look at my life, I was beaten and stoned and beaten and stoned. And I was, you know, all these things. He says, go read what I told you, what I told the folks in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, all the stuff that I went through, and I'm still here. And he's saying, that's what's keeping me going. But notice in chapter 2. <clears throat> notice in chapter 2, verse... 23. We'll start off in 23. Second, 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 23. Uh, Him therefore I hope to send diligently as soon as I see how it will go with me. Verse 24, But I trust in the Lord that I also myself, notice, shall come shortly. So, is Paul expecting to get out of prison? According to that verse, he's expecting to get out, right? So, would it have been during his second imprisonment when he comes to the realization and says, I know I want to go die? Or is it that first imprisonment where he says, I expect to get out? He's expecting to get out, all right? And that's one of those things, <clears throat> as we think through this, that's, that's the stuff that, that, uh, that we've got to be able to keep in mind. Which one, which one he's talking about. He's not talking about that first imprisonment or that second imprisonment. He's talking about the first one. He's expecting to get out on that one. All right. So again, Philippians, he writes during his first Roman imprisonment. <clears throat> and then this will be real quick. Let's do this. Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 4. Verse 3. Philippians chapter 4. Notice in verse 3. Uh, With all praying also for us that God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. Notice, for which I am also in bonds. So is Paul in bonds or in prison? Again, he's talked about this in Ephesians and Philippians, and he's continuing on here in Colossians. He's still in prison, right? He's still in prison, and he's talking about that. You notice, what's the reason he's in prison? Notice what he says. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to what? Speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Why is he in prison? Speaking the mystery of Christ. Because he's going around telling people about the mystery, they put him in jail. And so then, when you think of this, what's what's going on here is he's in prison, he's in bonds. Um, Notice... Drop down to verse 7. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Notice he says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. And he he goes on down. He he mentions Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, uh, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things. And he goes down. He's talking about uh, Aristarchus and Marcus and Barnabas, uh, the this, this sister's son of, uh, to Barnabas. Um, he's, he talks about Jesus in verse 11, who's also called Justice, and he, he, Epaphras in verse 12, and he starts naming all these people. But notice in verse 7, he says, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother. So who is it that's bringing that book of Colossians to the folks that Colossae will be? Tychicus. Right? So we see he's the one that's sending that during his first imprisonment. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I want to finish this. Yeah, let's just go ahead and finish up Philemon. All right, let's get, let's get Philemon. Or Philemon. <clears throat> This is, this is one of those you always get in the habit of saying this, and you're like, all right, Philemon chapter 1. The problem is there's only one chapter. Uh, so you get in the habit of saying that, so then people's like, oh, yeah, there's only one chapter. So let's, let's talk about um, Philemon real quick, or Philemon. Philemon, uh, notice in verse 1. <clears throat> Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, 
Um, notice how he starts off there. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten, notice, in my bonds. Now, what I want you to think about real quick is when, when Paul's talking about on, uh, Onesimus, we just read about him in Philippians, right? Okay, He's talking about Onesimus in Philippians. But notice, but notice he says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten, when? In my bonds. When is it that he's, well, when is it that he presents the gospel to Onesimus and Onesimus trusts in that gospel is while he's in bonds, uh, while he's in prison there, all right? Um, we've already looked at Onesimus in, in Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. Um, we saw it in Philemon. We didn't talk about it in Colossians, did we? Hey, Colossians chapter 4. <clears throat> we talked about him in Philippians. Um, we talked about him in Colossians chapter 4. Um, notice in verse 7, he, he's, he's talking about um, Tychicus here. Notice in verse 9, he says, With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, which is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So he's talking about Tychicus and Onesimus. So, question. <clears throat> When we talk about this, who's delivering the book of Colossians is Onesimus and Tychicus. All right? uh, he, says to, he says Onesimus is with him. Um, which notice he says, which is one of you. So does that mean Onesimus is from Colossae? You, know, you think about, you, you start putting some of these things together. But we see, we see that Onesimus here in verse, verse 9, he's, he's part of this crew or group that he sends with Tychicus to take the book of Colossians to the folks in, in Colossae. Um, and so then he also allows him to take the book of Philemon back to Philemon. Um, which is, you know, if you read the book of Philemon, you understand what's going on in the book of Philemon. Um, to get a letter from somebody that you think owes or that you know owes you something and then you've got this letter that says, oh, by the way, you can't hold what, what, what I owe you against me anymore. <laughs> but it was written by Paul. And Paul is saying to, to Philemon, says, whatever Onesimus owes you, put it on my account. Um, and so that's one of those things that we see there. Colossians chapter 4, <clears throat> uh, verse 17 uh, he's also talking about, uh, verse 17, he says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by, my, by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. So we see he's talking about uh, Archippus. Go back to Ph uh, Philemon. <clears throat> Philemon, uh, Philemon verse 2. Notice he says, And to our beloved um, Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and of the church in thy house. Grace to grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see Archippus here is the same one he's talking about over in Colossians. Notice in verse 22, all right? <clears throat> Philemon verse 22. Notice, but with all, prepare me also a lodging. Why do you think he's telling Philemon to prepare him a place to live? Is again, just like he said in Philippians, he's expecting to get out of prison. Notice he says, For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Uh, there salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow, uh, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, uh, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So then what do we see here? Verse, you know, he's, he's got all these other people with him. And he's saying, prepare me a lodging because he's expecting to get out. All right. So I would say that Paul's writing Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon uh, 
at about the same time while he's in prison during that first imprisonment. Okay, So those would have been when he's writing those during his first imprisonment. The, the thing to think about that is if, if, this is, if, this is, if this is true, which I think it is, um, that throws a cog in all the Acts 28 people's machinery. Okay, because they'll say the only books written to us as members of the church, the body of Christ, are books written after Acts 28. And they think that Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon weren't written until after Acts 28. Well, he's in prison the first time in Acts chapter 28, and he's writing those books while he's in prison in Acts 28. So then if you believe the Acts 28 position, there's only three books left, 1 Timothy, uh, Titus, and 2 Timothy. Those are the only three books that are left after Acts 28. So then their whole position, like I said, throws throws a throws a little little wrench in their call in the in in the in the machinery there. He writes those four books while he's in prison. Right? So we've got what? Galatians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Corinthians. Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So that's the ten. So we've got three books that are left, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. All right? So I kind of gave you the, the order of them anyway uh, just then. But, but what I want to do is look at um, why we know that. Uh, and we'll take a look at that. And we'll finish those up next week and then, then kind of go from there. Uh, questions on that so far? up to this point. So we've got 10 of the books. And like I said, these these move pretty quick once once you get to these. But to see that Paul's in prison when he's writing all four of those books, that tells us it has to be that first in prison because he's expecting to get out. Now, there is one thing that I, I saw a book while we were up in Chicago at that conference. Um... One person does have 1 Timothy written back in here somewhere. Um, I, don't, I don't see that as being possible. Uh, but we'll talk about that <clears throat> next week. Questions? Now, I know that, that the last little part here, we went pretty quick, but those, those weren't too much to deal with. I mean, we know that he's in prison when he writes them. Um, then he gets out. Writes a couple books, then he goes back into prison and writes his last one. All right, so the the main issue with this, you know, we've talked about the purpose. The purpose behind doing this one is we get rid of the Acts twenty position, which says Paul preached the gospel of the kingdom up until Acts twenty, and then Acts twenty he starts preaching the grace of God. Um, what we do also is we're able to take that Acts twenty eight position and kick it out the window. Um, by taking a look at this. Now, the more important thing for me is what can we do with this information as we move forward? You know, little things like when did Paul stop baptizing? Uh, when did Paul stop performing miracles or, you know, speaking in tongues or anything like that? Can we get an idea of when those things took place? Um, and that, that's kind of the main purpose of what I'm thinking about. I guess really the main purpose, I guess that would be a secondary. The main purpose would be, let's take a look at the life of Paul as he went through and he learned this information. Just as you and I learn it, the only difference is, is you know, there's a big difference in Jesus Christ saying, hey, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm doing now. So you'll know what's going on. That's a big difference than that and us reading about it. But do we, are we able to see 
Paul learning this information and then applying that new information that he's learned. And that's the big, big issue that I want us to be able to pull away from this is to see him actually change his mind on things and actually start applying that information. You know, <clears throat> when you're reading, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and Paul is talking about all these things he's going through and then all of a sudden over in Philippians, he's like, this is all for the furtherance of the gospel, so bring it on. You know, there's a big difference in, in the thought process before and after that, uh, that encounter with Christ uh, where he was taken up to the third heaven. All right. <clears throat> um, so we'll take a look at the video, see how this looks. I don't know if anybody said anything about whether they can still not read it or not, but I need to redo it. I can. All right. Questions? Comments, concerns, we're almost done. We're getting there. Yeah, really good stuff. I enjoy it. I like this stuff. The math mind likes putting those things together. Yeah. The problem is, is I know sometimes it doesn't always come across the way I want it to. But no, it's not that you're slow. It's it. There's a lot of information, in a lot of places you got to keep in mind too. So, well, no, you're not slow. It, it's almost kind of like a puzzle. Over yeah, there. yeah. Because you're going to find something over here that refers to this way over here. Yeah. Well, that's like I said, with 2 Corinthians, your puzzle piece on the box says Ephesus, a small stir, and Macedonia. So then you go and look in your pieces that match that piece on the box and you put it in the right place. Yeah. And that's really what it is. I guess, a, I guess a puzzle analogy would be better than the map analogy. But, um Everybody loves math. What are you talking about? Um, but no, like I said, there's there's three books that we've got left, and I've kind of already given you the, the idea of when I think that they were written. All of those would have been written after his imprisonment. So it would have been after Acts 28. Um, like I said, some people have First Timothy written during his third apostolic journey. I don't, I don't really see it that way, but we'll talk about it. All right. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna stick around for a little bit, do a couple of videos for TV. So if you all want to stay, you're more than welcome. If you're tired of hearing me, I understand. I'd like to leave myself sometimes. No, I was joking. All right. We'll end off with a word of prayer there, and then we'll we'll finish this up uh, next week. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we take the information that we've uh, study it out today, study it out for ourselves to find out whether or not these things be so, that ultimately we get an idea of, of when Paul learned certain things and when Paul started to apply certain things in his life and how we can see that, that information uh, grow within him as he lives and walks and have his being on earth just as we do um, here today. We know that as soon as we get saved, we don't automatically know and understand everything. And we can't know and uh, know how to apply all that information that we have. But we know that we come to the knowledge of the truth over a period of time, just as, just as Paul did. And we can take comfort in the fact that we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray.